when I heard that voice, I had just, I was living in Houston at the time and I had just completed a, a six mile run. And uh, after I finished that run, I, 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 I slowed down, I began to walk. And I will tell you, when I heard that voice in the park, it was a Saturday morning. The park is pretty busy. There's lots of people around, voices and such. Everything went silent except that voice. It's, it's like everything else got blocked out and, and, and that voice came in with that direction. Do this, uh, put your notice in at your job, uh, plan to move here. Before you go to New York, reach out to this person. It was only an acquaintance at the time. This person will connect you with another person and that will lead to you. Uh Uh, hi, this is Tom Rapsis, and I'm on Your Superior Self. Tom, my man, thank you for joining us tonight on this episode of Your Superior Self. I find it so fascinating that you've written, well, not that you've written a book, right? You've written like hundreds of articles on um, websites and you're a blogger. But the fact that uh, we can connect and you're uh, from the area that I grew up, right? The Eastern Shore, uh, Eastern Shore guy. Um, I really like and enjoy and connect with you on that level. But um, some of your blogs and some of your messages dive deep into spirituality and not just like, you know, traditional or conventional religion, but like some of the uh, deeper thoughts uh, pieces that I really enjoy. Like, what does it actually mean to connect with God? And one of your um, articles that I pulled up is 10 surprising truths about Jesus you won't hear in church. I, and I can't wait to really connect with you on this, on these types of topics, because I think that uh, they're pretty popular. So thank you for taking the time. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. So, man, I want to know how this start for you, right? Like, uh, I think you were, you have a marketing background. When did it turn to like writing blogs about spirituality and, and, and really tying that together and, and creating this book about daily insights for the spiritually curious. Well, yeah, the writing kind of came late, later. I mean, you mentioned I'm, uh, I, I do work in advertising half for many years, so I'm a writer by trade. But the spirituality thing kind of came a little bit later to me. I, I was probably in the advertising business about 10 years, and uh, I, I, I kind of found it lacking. I was jumping jobs a lot. I had something like eight jobs in 10 years, and something was missing. And uh, I eventually landed on that missing thing as spirituality. I, I had this kind of hole in my life, and I was looking for a way to fill it, and uh, I went down the spiritual road. I didn't actually write about it for, I'm going to say, a good 20 years in. At a certain point, I started writing articles for a, a small town uh, publication. I'd write write once a month, uh, a monthly article. But then uh, I guess about 15 years ago, uh, I started writing for Elephant Journal. It's kind of a primarily a, a, an online publication about yoga and related subjects. But then I went to work for Pathios, well, 12, 13 years ago, and uh, I've been writing the wake-up call column there for, uh, feels like forever. I've, I've written over 500 stories, probably close to 600 at, at this time. So going through your book, right, um, there were some, a lot of interesting quotes from different philosophies and different books. Did you read all of those books? I, I did. I've read a lot of books. Uh, to be honest with you, I mean, some books I will skim, but if, if I'm digging the content, I, I will read it from cover to cover. Wow. Because there's like quotes from like Thomas Merton, John Michael Talbot, uh, just a, a couple of, I've made a list here of all the, the books that really meant something to me. And I mean, uh, how do you, how do you go about researching for your, for your blogs? How do you go about setting yourself up to write one? Well, yeah, I, I, I can tell you uh, uh, for a long period of time, uh, you know, we mentioned that I work in advertising. I, I was working in New York city and I was living at the Jersey shore and I was an extreme commuter. I was on the last direct bus line to New York city that you could get. So I had this hellacious commute. It was almost two and a half hours each way. So I had a lot of time in the bus and uh, a lot of time to kill. 
So, so what I would do usually in the mornings is I, I, I would, you know, have a book or books with me. I'd read in the way up and then on the way back, if I wasn't writing, I was listening to podcasts. So uh, I tried to make good use of the time. And for, and for me, that was just really kind of digging into a, a lot of different spiritual areas. Mm. What about uh, personal stories? Are there any personal stories in the book? There are some, uh, you know, it was funny when I first wrote the book and, and kind of turned it in and, and the book, uh, as you know, Trey, I mean, it's, it's a compilation of my top, it's actually 112 stories in the book. And I went through about 500 at that point in time, uh, 500 comms, uh, picked what I thought were the best ones, organized them, had a big cut down process. And when the book was kind of ready to go, the, my editor said to me, you know, you don't have a lot of personal stuff in here. So I said, you know, I can tell a couple stories and I worked those into the introduction. I mean, I, I've since realized, of course, I had many more. Uh, I, I got used to really writing about the teachings of others and not always sharing what I learned, my, you know, what was happening in my own life. I've begun to do that more uh, over probably the last year or two. And, and I do include some personal anecdotes in the uh, introduction to the book. So, man, I'm really curious to know, like, how do you experience reality, right? Like you've written all these spiritual uh, anecdotal blog posts, but like, how do right. you, Tom, experience reality? With total awareness. I mean, I, I, I write about this, you know, in different ways throughout the book. But for me, uh, the experience of reality, the reason the book is called Wake Up Call is that I'm guilty of this as well, kind of sleepwalking through life, you kind of just get in these patterns, especially if you're in the, in the, in the work world where you are just uh, going on remote pilot. You, you, you just kind of go through the, the motions without kind of paying attention to the things that are around you. So... I try to change that. And again, it's a constant battle to this day, every day, but to be totally aware of my surroundings and, and, and what's going on. I mean, there, there's a guy I wrote about, I think the story's in the book, Sean Askinosi, and he, and he runs this chocolate company where they outsource the cocoa from uh, different countries around the world, a lot of them in Africa. And he's got so he writes this book about his business, but he's got all this spiritual stuff in it. And he's he has something called the five dings a day spiritual practice. And it's it it sounds almost like the Muslim call to prayer, where they're called to prayer several times a day. In his book, he has his he talks about this method where he has his phone set that five times a day a bell goes off. And it is just a constant reminder to be aware, to give thanks. And to look around him and see exactly what's going on. I mean, I, I, I'm doing that right now. And, and, and I, I look in front of me and just at a view here, there, there's a flower, I mean, a, a little plant that's bloomed. And I'll be honest with you, it, it probably just bloomed a, a day or two ago. I haven't noticed, I hadn't noticed it, but man, it, it's nice. But that's part of it. I mean, it's just trying to be spiritually awake. And and that kind of is, you know, like I mentioned, is where that title wake up call comes from. Hmm. What does it mean to be awake to you, right? Like I hear that term quite, a, quite a bit and especially like to, to be woke, right? We hear that all the time. What does right. it mean? What does it mean for you? Uh, to experience life through, through all your senses, but really to, um, to be in touch with, you know, your core. What, what uh, and I know in a story the book is referred to as the true self. So, I I, I think we can kind of go through life with um, our ego kind of leading the way, and we kind of judge everything very quickly. Um, our 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 ego is looking for the quick fix, is looking for short term happiness. But I think what I try to do somewhat is kind of step back a little bit, step out of the fray, be, it's called being in the world, but not being of the world and just kind of trying to distance myself just a bit 
from what's going around around uh, around me. So when there's you know if I'm at work, if I'm in a busy scene, I'm not caught up in that chaos. I'm kind of sitting back and observing it. Mm -hmm. You work from home, right? So that's uh that's I do seeing, now. <laughs> I guess that's seeing, a big change. That's a big change. It that's is, seeing, and you you know it's a nice change. Working from uh, Eastern Shore, man, it's a beautiful country down there. You know, it's some beautiful it, it, country. It is, it is. Where I am now, I can look at look at the. Uh, you know, I I'll frequently work from uh, a back porch that looks at woods, and uh, as you know, I'm in an area with lots of pine trees. So, it's uh, yeah, it's great sure. to be in touch with nature like that. How do you speak to uh, our our common folk down there? Do you talk to them about awareness and and being a, a awakened to consciousness at higher levels and frequencies. Like I think, I think it's a little tough down there to have some I, of those conversations. I hear you. And you know, I, I, I'll tell you a story. I mean, most people that, that I know here weren't aware of that spiritual side until I heard that until they hear, I have a book coming out. Oh really? What's the book about? And, and, and I tell them and they, they seem a little bit, a little bit surprised. And and I'm reminded of of this story. It was told by Stephen Mitchell, and and there there was this teacher in India, and he's got this group of students. So one one day the student uh, the teacher's out in the marketplace, and he sees two of the two of the students there, and they're out there, and they're kind of boasting about their spiritual knowledge and all the things that they're learning. And uh, he he sees them the next morning, and he calls them aside, and he said. Hey, listen, I, I heard you guys out there boasting about all this stuff you're learning, but here's how I want you to look at it. You know, you, you, you come to me with uh, the grime and dirt of life on your hands, and I give you the soap to get that grime off, but you don't go out in the world with the soap on your hands. You wash your hands first, you get the grime off, you get the soap out off so your hands are, are clean. And I kind of look at it like that, that, that the spirituality informs me, informs who I am, how I act, but I'm not going to try to talk to somebody about it unless they want to engage with me about it first. And of course, that's happening a little more now where I have a, a, a neighbor, 80 years old. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, he had no idea I was into this spiritual thing and he picked up the book and a few weeks later, he, he he basically confides to me that at 80, he's having trouble with his purpose in life. And that then opens up the conversation about, mm. hey, you know, what's going on in your world? And, and and here's how you might look at things a little little bit differently. Sure. There's a story in the book about your daughter, right? There's a personal story. Um, there is. That kind of makes me question, like, what is the nature of reality, right? Like, is this a simulation maybe? Because this... This story could be an example of a glitch in the system. Yes, I will tell that story. It, <laughs> you know, I, I mentioned about adding the personal anecdotes, and uh, when when that happened, I, I I wrote I wrote a story about it, and I quickly deleted it because it was so personal and so weird, and I I, I didn't know if I had the answers to what exactly happened, but uh, you know. The, the story, as, as you read, was uh, I'm, I'm a runner. I, I run three or four times a week to this day, uh, a little slower these days. But at the time, uh, my daughter used to like to go out with me when she first learned to ride a bike on my runs. And she's five, six years old at the time. And she wasn't very, wasn't aware enough of traffic and staying away from cars. I, I was living in a really small town on the Jersey Shore at the time. And as we went for this run, we were kind of, you know, she's biking alongside me. We were nearing the end. And there, at a certain point on the path, you had to make a turn, go up a short hill, and then make a left into what was the main road in town. And, and that main road was not very busy. It was a two-lane road with a, a shoulder on each side. The shoulders were very narrow. And as we ran up this short hill, we had to make a left to go back to my home, which was just a few blocks away. And there was a truck parked in the shoulder. And she would have to make a left beyond that truck uh, to head home, except 
the shoulders very narrow. She wasn't paying attention. I saw her get ahead of me. She made a left turn beyond the truck, which would have put her in the lane of traffic. Uh, my heart's about to jump out of my chest because at the moment she makes that turn, I see a car buzz down the road. I can remember to this day, it was a station wagon. The uh, driver was a guy, he looked, looked to be 80 years old, had a lot of stubble on his face, glasses. He goes whizzing by. And my thought was, oh my God, my daughter had to be hit by that car. She had made the left. There was no shoulder for her to be in. She was in the lane of traffic. I round the corner um, just past the truck and I see her there and she is on the road and she's turned back to look for me. And she says to me as clear as day, uh, daddy, am I dead? And I remember I responded, no, honey, you're okay. You're not dead. And I really, it, it shook me to my core. Uh, I mean, to the point where I can recall, and this happened in the morning, that night I didn't sleep a wink. I was awake all night trying to figure out what the heck happened. And if if she was in that lane of traffic and had just turned around and was looking at me, I would have thought, well, oh, that guy must have just missed her. He must have swerved around her uh, to get by her. But when she said those words, uh, Daddy, am I dead? It, it went way beyond anything I could comprehend. And uh, I've spent years trying to figure out what that meant, uh, what happened um, to basically, you know, save her life and save mine. And and I, I posit in the book that, that you know, uh, there's a theory that called the many worlds theory. It's in quantum physics. It's invented by a guy by the name of you, Everett. And he believed that at every point in life, at every decision we make, the world splits up into branches and we can decide to do one thing. But on the other side, there are branches. If we decide to turn right, for instance, there are other branches where we turn left and the world constantly is dividing into all these branches. But we're only aware of the one branch that we're in at that point in time. So I thought that, as you kind of alluded to, that maybe the wires got crossed and my daughter was in this other world, this other dimension, yet somehow uh, she got brought back. Hmm. Wow. I, I, had, I, had, I had someone ask me the question, you know, well, what did that, you know, what, what's your take from that? And I said, well, maybe, you know, it would have ruined me. It would have ruined me. And I thought, well, maybe this was to prolong my life. And, and this person rightly said to me, he said, well, Maybe it's something your daughter is supposed to do in this lifetime. And it's really not about you. And I said, well, that's very true. That could be it. Well, but uh, yeah, if, crazy story. And I'll, I'll, I'll just one, one side note to that. I, I didn't mention this story to my wife for years, a few years later. I mentioned it to my daughter 10 years later. And, and uh, she was probably 15, 16 at the time. And she had absolutely no recollection. Didn't recall it at all. Really? That could have been the skipping of the timelines. You know, um, but if, you know, my theory is if this timeline we're on is for your highest possible good, I don't think that that event occurring the way that you thought it did would have benefited you in the, in the highest possible good. Right. Like, I don't know. I mean, right. I think there's, I mean, do we really know what life is about and why things happen? I don't know. Maybe we're just experiencing, you know, like there are, the people that have died in my life, the people that have passed away, maybe they're alive, you know, in a different dimension, right? Like they're, I mean, who knows if it's many worlds, there's many possibilities. Like there's many worlds for every choice, every yes or no to my decision base. Right. And right. Uh, I wonder if we can tap into those, right? Like I wonder if we through meditation or like the imagination can tap into those other realities and experience it, maybe not physically, but like, through the mind, if that makes sense. Have you ever experienced anything similar to that? I have not. You know, I, I, I'm reading more recently. I've been reading, uh, he may be familiar with Dr. Joe Dispenza. And, and there's another woman out there who writes similar stories. Uh, the Energy Code, her name is Dr. Susan. I want to say Morgan. 
but they are talking about tapping into through meditation. And again, I'm reading, you know, I usually have about seven or eight books going on at the same time. I have both, both these books happening that you are kind of able to tap into a certain energy that, that, uh, that kind of, you know, has the ability to re remove you from this world somewhat. So, uh, I, I, I read about it. I'm not there yet, but it's definitely an area that I, I'm going to explore. How about you, Trey? I mean, have, have you had these ex experiences through meditation at all? I'm starting to toy with this modality called quantum jumping, right? Um, where, and I'm trying to think of the guy's name. I can't remember his name right now. It's eluding me, but to where you imagine your highest possible version of yourself and go to that, to that place in the universe and talk to them. You know, the thing that you want to achieve, you envision yourself achieving that. And then you go and have a conversation with that individual or yourself. And then they give you pointers and give you guidance in this life to bring back. And then I've also heard of things similar to where, you know, you're, you're doing the same thing for health or well, not just wealth, but it's for health as well. Like you're imagining that, that yourself already healed from whatever your, your ailments are or whatever you need healing for. And then you're bringing that back, that vibration back with you into this reality and then able to envisual, envisual or visualize yourself being healed. Um, Bert Gold, Goldman, I think his name is, if I'm saying that right. Um, he has, he's like 80 or 90 years old. He's been teaching these methods for a really long time. Um, it's called quantum jumping. And you basically get into like a meditative, meditative state, like, like a hypnotic right. state. And then you go into this process and deep re relaxation. You're able to envision yourself, whatever that may be, right? Like if you want to be a, uh, a New York Times bestselling author, you envision yourself what that looks like. And then you have a conversation like, how do I become a better writer? And then they're giving you advice along the along the way on what to do, right? It might not be spe you know, specifically you need to do X, Y, and Z, but it could lead you to something like an aha moment that puts you in a different direction that you're, you're currently in and changes your entire reality, essentially, if that makes sense. Uh, it makes sense. It, it, again, it, it it's, yeah, tapping into something greater than ourselves. I, I, I do think that that can potentially uh, happen. I haven't experienced it yet, but certainly I'm going to start dwelling uh, into these areas in the future as, as I uh, approach retirement here. Sure. I look forward to doing a, a deeper dive into some of those subjects. I've done a couple of uh, sessions in quantum jumping and I, I envision myself as a, a public speaker. Like that's the next thing in my, I think in my path. And I was uh, in my vision and my meditation, I was like very success, uh, successful um, uh, speaker. And I was just, you know, kind of asking for tips and guidance. And that version of myself was essentially like, you have to merge your energy with the energy of the room. Right. And then um, once you meld into that, and, and for whatever reason, he's like, it's just like being in your living room, like essentially connecting with your family. So once you merge with that, with that energy, you kind of feed off of that and go with it and you can read people and see who needs to hear what. And then it's just like being in your living room with your family. Like when I'm having conversations with my family, that's how like the comfort level that you should have when you're speaking should be like you're in an, inside of a living room. It's like, that's yes. not like an X, Y, and Z kind of answer. It's more or less like saying things that resonate with me and like, Oh, that makes sense. I, well, I would never say that to myself. Right. Like I, I don't know the, the, the first thing about being a successful public speaker as uh, besides getting up there and actually doing it. But like, that makes sense to me, like connect with the room. And I haven't really studied public speaking. So to me, that would make sense to connect with the room, feel the energy yes. of the room. And then you get to a point where you start getting more comfortable in what you're talking about, you know, in body, you know, the, the message to where you can speak in front of a, a room of a thousand people, like you're speaking to five people in your living room. If that makes sense. Right. Right. So, so Trey, the question, I have a question for you. Then, then the voice that you heard, did you feel like this is your own more advanced self it was coming from yourself or, or, or was it a voice separate from you? I felt like it was myself. Um, I don't really like, it wasn't a voice, right. It was more or less like a communication between me and that, in that version. And I guess because I'm used to having conversations like this verbally and through the physical body, maybe I envisioned like the mouth moving, but it was more or less like, it was just like a, it was a transference of information essentially. Right. But I felt, but I felt like it was myself. 
Yeah, very cool. I mean, I, I told an anecdote where I at one point heard a voice that, that, that came from myself that kind of changed my direction in life, had me move, me quit a job, move across the country without a job. It's how I first landed in New York City. But in that case, when I, when I heard that voice, who knows? It, was it my future self coming back to kind of point me in the right direction? I don't know. I felt like the voice as clear and crisp as it was, was, was not quite my own, but you do raise, I mean, now that I, now that I'm kind of getting into these areas myself, you, it, it does raise the question. It, it, is that a, a part of myself from the future that, that was actually speaking to me that wanted to point me in the right direction? I mean, you kind of allude to this. I mean, the, the idea is that, you know, all time exists. We're only aware of the present moment right now, but all time exists. So if you do believe that, and I do, then I, I don't see how a future, you know, why a future part of yourself couldn't come back and really offer advice to your current self. Sure. Well, Robin Monroe, you've read his his work, right? I have, the Monroe Institute. Yes. Yeah. So a lot of his out-of-body experiences he thought were experiences with with entities outside of himself, like other conscious beings. And in actuality, it was him the entire time coming back uh, and helping himself essentially get outside of the body and then have these adventures in the non-physical, you know, and all of his growth, all of his learning was essentially him himself guiding him along that path, which I thought was a, like, um, a great point because if time and space is like totally different on the other side, like that would make sense to me that he could do something like that. And then to your point of that voice, what if it is a future version of Tom coming back and whispering in your ear, Hey, you need to do this. And it totally changes the, the trajectory of your life. Right. I mean, did you, With, did without you... a doubt. It, it, and I can tell you, I mean, it, the, the circumstances around that, uh, it, it was kind of unusual in that at that point, I mentioned the fact that I run, I had just done a, and, and I think part of that is just being in the right mindset. If you can access that mindset, you know, get out of the way a little bit. Uh, when I heard that voice, I had just, I was living in Houston at the time and I had just completed a, a six mile run and I used to go at a pretty good clip back then. And uh, after I finished that run, I, I, I slowed down, I began to walk. And I will tell you when I heard that voice in the park, it was a Saturday morning. The park is pretty busy. There's lots of people around voices and such. Everything went silent. I didn't hear anything else around me except that voice. It's it's like everything else got blocked out and 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 that voice came in with that direction. Mm -hmm. And you know, if that voice had said to me, uh, you know, uh, uh, go kill your neighbor's dog, you know, son of Sam like, you know, I I would have been smart enough to say, "Hey, that's not good. That's not right." But this voice just seemed to know so well. I mean, it, me and 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 uh, it was so clear and concise and Really, it's from my heart, from my soul. I had such a trust in it that I listened to what that voice had to say. Was it a male voice? I, um, was not female, so I, I, I guess male. And and it was like a you know a certain uh, set of kind of instructions, commands, like step by step, do this. You know, uh, uh, put your notice in at your job. Uh, plan to move here. Before you go to New York, reach out to this person. It was only an acquaintance at the time. This person will connect you with another person, and that will lead to you. Uh, and it led to me actually reuniting with the woman who became and is still my wife to this day. Wow. Uh, so uh, were you open to these types of um, philosophies back then? I, you know, I, I, I think I was, if, if anything in, in those early days, I, I, I think spirituality, and we talked about this a little bit, I, I began to venture a little bit into some of the, maybe the supernatural elements of it. I, I think I've probably have gone more mainstream since then. I mean, I've always been interested in uh, th this idea of, um, you know, uh, UFOs and aliens and What's the connection between an alien and an angel? 
I, I just went back and I've started rereading things I read 30 years ago. I, I just read a book about uh, Edgar Cayce. Uh, he, he was the clairvoyant. Uh, the sleeping who, prophet, right? Exactly. The sleeping prophet who, who uh, was able to enter the, these different dimensions of consciousness. But to me, that kind of that, that stuff is is fascinating. I, I will say, I, I think I ventured more in as part of my working life to, okay, there are means, more mainstream spiritual practices that are going to help you live a happier, more contented life to basically survive it was soul intact, the nine to five world. So I, I, I did pursue that for, well, I, I can say decades. But I, I am starting to venture out a little bit more into some of these uh, esoteric, maybe some people consider them out there, spiritual ideas that I, I think have merit. Mm -hmm. hmm. You, you, talk a lot, you talk a lot about mysticism, right? And you give a lot of examples in the book about mystics, um, some modern day mystics and their, their beliefs on what God truly is, right? Like, I, I want to know what your what your definition of God is. Yeah, there's a the famous line, I, I think it's from this theologian, Paul Tillage. Um, uh, God is not a being, uh, it is being itself. So, it, it, and Emerson had this line, uh, every part and particle is God. So I, I, I kind of think that. I, I, I think that uh, we are immersed in God. Uh, God is all around us. And the place where you first find God is, this comes from people as diverse as Emerson or uh, uh, Yogananda the same, had, had the same uh, teachings that the place to find God is really within yourself. Um, uh, Richard Ward is another guy who said that, you know, when you really start f trying to look inside to your true self, you find God there. So I, I, I think that is, is the place where I've discovered what we call God, but, you know, God is open for interpretation. For me, it is more of the, the system, you know, you, you mentioned the word, the matrix. But God is the system that kind of runs the world. It's the glue that holds things together. And and God, the system works in funny ways. Uh, you know, we talk about coincidences and synchronicities. I do think that the world turns according to some greater plan. And uh, there is this essence of what we call God kind of directing it all. Well, what that, do you think? That's... Yeah. Sorry, you just before I forget. Um, what do you think synchronicities are? Right, because Nietzsche, he thought that synchronicities were just happenstance; they were just chance. Right? Do you do you have a different philosophy? Do you think they are actually signs from God's? You know, trying to get our attention. I, I do. I th I think sometimes coincidences are are just that, but there are other times when things happen that you just have to wonder if there is a, a, uh, a, a greater power uh, behind it all. Uh, and I won't say someone, but I think it's more something kind of directing uh, what happens in life um, within us, around us. And I think one of the key things we have to do as a, as a human being is kind of get in tune with this i think we miss a lot of signals that are given to us and i think henry nguyen is a, is a guy who talks about that it, that that um god talks to us um in these ways through these synchronicities through these experiences that connect one thing to another well i i think we miss that connection because of, of the noise that is surrounding us and that you know, we're giving our awareness to. And uh, what, I mean, like, what are your methods, right? Like if God is around us all of the time, if it's, a, if he or she is surrounding us, the universe is surrounding us. Like, how do we connect with that? Yeah. You know, you just mentioned that the fact that we, uh, we're just, you know, we're distracted. 
I mean, and, and, and we're distracted by the, the ego and, and the ego is only interested in really, uh, you know, short-term happiness, short-term goals. Um, I, I think we have to dig a, a little bit deeper into the soul and to do that, uh, I mean, the, the, the catchphrase is, uh, you know, these days is SBNR, I'm spiritual but not religious. I feel like I fall into that group. But I, I, I feel like those are false words unless you have some, site, some type of spiritual practice behind it. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, spirituality, it's just this idea that you're trying to connect to something greater than yourself. And it doesn't happen, I don't think, automatically. Maybe if you're lucky, it does happen sometimes like that. But it starts with, for me anyway, and for a lot of people, is I think you have to find solitude. I think you have to find moments in the day where you're by yourself without your phone and you're just there and you're not doing your being you're 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 just there in quiet for 15 minutes i, I think that's the the key do it in the morning do it at night do it whatever works for you but that to me is the first step you have to take if you are popping out of bed and the first thing you do is turn on your phone and start scrolling social media you're not going to get there you got to find that space uh to try to connect with something greater. And that starts in so with solitude. And from there, we can go to basic breathing techniques, meditation techniques, which I fought for years, but you know, I, I was a latecomer to the game to say, wow, meditation does have value uh, to doing things like other things, like uh, having experiences that are oh, you getting out in, in, in nature, for instance, um, I was just reminded the other day that there are two forms of meditation and one is where you empty yourself of everything. That's your traditional meditation where you're sitting there and you're focusing on the breath or you're, you're, you're focusing on a mantra, just trying to clear your head. But the other way, the other type of meditation is to fill your world with something, to go out into nature, to fill it with beauty, to sit on the beach, uh, it, and, and watch the waves coming into the shore. But you have to take the, I think these simple steps, these simple practices just to begin to connect with this something greater than yourself. Sure. I think the the noise, right? I don't, I don't know what it is, right? Like, so if we, if we quiet the mind, if we get into solitude, what, what does God's voice sound like to you when you connect with that? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, there, there's, uh, I, I think it's James Cart and, and his, his big thing is, uh, one of the books he wrote is that God is silence and that, you know, we just talked about hearing the voice. I mean, you hearing the voice and I, I, I myself heard the voice, but God is often found, I think in silence. Uh, we we talk, and this is coming from Cars. We talk, God listens, and He responds in silence. And I think what that means, and you don't get that and, until you're in that quiet space, meditation space, or that quiet moment of solitude. And I, I, I kind of think of myself as a little bit post meditation now that once you meditate for a little bit, you can kind of know what that mindset is and fall back into it. But it's in that space, it's in that silence that you can feel or sense the presence that is God. Um, I, I, I'm reading this book now, and uh, I heard about it. I saw some good reviews. It's, it's by Rick Rubin. It's called The Creative Act. And Rick Rubin is the he's a music producer. He's known for music. So I saw the title. I saw a decent review. I didn't really read it, but I thought, okay, he's going to be talking about how he inspires musicians. But when you go into the book, you realize, no, he's talking about inspiration for everybody and all walks of life. And one of the things he talks about is, is this idea that it's for most people within this silence that if we have our tuning fork on, if we are truly listening, that then guidance comes. 
Um, this is something that Emerson called lowly listening. And, and, and Emerson almost was writing about the same thing in the 1830s, 1840s. This lowly listening is kind of, it, it is what it sounds like, where you kind of just wind yourself down a little bit. You go deep into yourself. And if you have a question, if you have an issue, if you're looking for direction, you just put it out to the universe. And if the answer doesn't come to you then, it will eventually materialize it throughout the day. Now, wow. Ruben uses that to, to inspire his musicians uh, to try to get ahead. But, but he also admits, he said, well, some it doesn't work for all people because some people, for the inspiration to come, they need humanity around them. And it seems like from that humanity around them, then the answers you know, seem to come. It's funny you say that because I was listening to a podcast, um, Stephen Pressfield. Um, he right. wrote the the war of art the war of art he, yes he says that he basically connects with something outside of himself when he's in trying to search for creativity like the muse of creativity whatever that may be and he goes into a story and he's essentially like surrenders to that and whatever comes forth he just he gets into this flow state and then it just kind of flows from him and i've done that a couple of times where i have um, surrendered myself in humility to the universe, to that, you know, female version of creativity and ask for guidance. And I've been able to, if you want to call it a channel, but like I've been able to receive information that has allowed me to be more creative and get into different flow states that allow me to access information that was like, Hey, you should try this or you should do this or, or whatever. Right. Like that my analytical brain tries to digest and like, scrutinized but i can't really put my finger on it why i wanted to you know i went in, in this certain direction it just kind of flowed right and i think it's in those moments that we have to be open to something larger than ourselves because there's just no way that you know some of the ideas that i was that i was coming up with that i had i don't have a background in you know like creating like visual art or visual aids for the for the the podcast but like just you know even like a th like a, um uh a teaser clip right like I get into deep flow states when I'm creating these and inspiration just, it's like pops up. It's just like, boom, it's right there. Not all the time. Right. I have to do certain things to get me into these states. Right. I can't be worrying about what I'm going to have for lunch, but I have to, you know, kind of surrender, you know, give a little humility, just say, you know, give me some guidance, give me some help, you know, in producing this or even like a preparation for an interview just give me some help, give me some flow. And then all of a sudden something will come up and it just, I don't have to, I don't even really have to think really. It just kind of bubbles up from nowhere. Right. Right. It, it, that, that, that signal is out there. We just have to kind of tune our internal radio to, to find it. For sure. Now I want to know, I don't know if you remember this, this blog post or not. So just a quick question for my clarification, when you're writing your blog posts, what are the most popular ones? Like, which ones get the most traction? Oh, it, it could be because of the site I'm on, but the, it's uh, it's definitely the 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 Jesus posts, and and I and I I think a lot of people may click on those stories, and and be disappointed because I'm coming at Jesus from an unconventional angle. I mean, I've written stories like uh, the ten things you won't hear about Jesus in church. And and stories like that, and uh, I, I I think I I maybe do intend to provoke a little bit, but I I do think a lot of religion has has uh, gotten Jesus wrong or isn't doesn't you know really give us the true message of Jesus. Hmm. I totally agree. I feel like I was just talking. Uh to my mom today um shout out to mom that i just feel like the bible is just so redacted you know it's so filtered it's so edited like what do you, what do you really like how do you really know right like i feel like you take it on faith and people will argue faith but then i also argue like yeah there's some commonalities like there's some small messages like there's not you know there there are positive messages in the bible that's you know, not saying there isn't i'm just saying like how do you truly know what you know what the angle of the church was when they wrote it, right? Like, how do we know right. some guy, you know, just saying, oh, you know, let's put this in here. Let's take this out. 
you know, uh, reincarnation for, for uh, example, you're reading Edgar Casey, right? Like yes, the existential shock that he felt when he realized that, um, uh, when he channeled that reincarnation is an actual thing that it's legit, like, like his whole world was turned upside down because he was a hardcore conservatist, you know, cons um, conservative and his religion didn't teach him that. And then when he channeled that message, he, he really struggled with that. Like would his family right. disown him? Would his friends disown him? Like, because this is, goes against everything he was taught. But so that's my point is how do we truly know what is accurate in that? If they right. have taken things out, right? But I'm well, not... a, a couple thoughts there. You know, I, I agree with the with the Bible, and I, I I've written. I, I to me, you know, and I at one point I read the New Testament. This is going back twenty twenty five years ago. Could, no way I could get through the Old Testament, and finding valuable information was like finding a needle in a haystack to me. You, you you'd uh, you know sometimes uh, you know an idea would pop up you know often some of the teachings of Jesus but you could go a hundred pages and not come up with any, you know an, another thing of, of of note at least as far as I was concerned and one of the you know you I think you mentioned the mystics um, the Bible is not really a, a I mean the Bible was written 2,000 years ago, and, and Matthew Fox, who I wrote about, he's he's a great theologian. It, it, I actually had a conversation with him once, and he said to me, you know, a lot of people think that the Bible is the be-all and end-all, but that assumes that God stopped talking to us 2,000 years ago mm -hmm. and hasn't talked to us since. And it's not, he said, it's not true. And he points then to the mystics. And says the mystics are having this direct experience with God, and there are several big ones I, I've written about. Julian of Norwich, I wrote about uh, fairly recently, who then come away with these different messages that sort of parallel what you might hear Jesus say in the non-traditional gospels, the Gnostic gospels that were not included in the Bible. But really, the mystics believe that you don't need a middleman to go to God and you, you can have this direct experience of God yourself. And that's, I think the problem with the church is that the church too often gets in the way of God. Um, I, I, I was just this past uh, December at a, uh, a Catholic mass and I was raised a, a, a Catholic. And at one point they had uh, communion at the mass which I was going to pass on, but you could also go up and get a blessing from the priest. And a friend of mine, I was at the wedding with turned to me and said, you know, you're going up for the blessing. And, and I, I, I said, no, I don't need the priest to bless me. I have a direct connection. I don't need the middleman. And to me, that, that that's true. I, I think if religion, if church works for you, great. And I know it works for some people, but I think uh, for a lot of people, it, it just leaves them a little empty. And, and you have to start exploring other pursuits outside of mainstream religion. And that can include even the teachings of Jesus that are not found in the Bible. And they're found in this uh, these books called the, the, the Gnostic Gospels. Now, they, they, they can be a very tough read. But there are some books out there. I mean, Elaine Pagels wrote this book back in the 60s called The Gnostic Gospels, where she basically has read them all. And then she drills down and says, OK, here are some of the key messages Jesus is trying to get across. And it's got to be pointed pointed out that, you know, when I, I mentioned that the title, 10 things uh, you want to hear in church about Jesus, one is Jesus did not set up a religion. He, he was trying to fix uh, Judaism. He was not looking to set up his own religion. That was not his intent. We might as well go through all the, re the, the rest of those too. Because <laughs> I really, I enjoyed the 10 truths about Jesus. So one, Jesus never set out to create a religion. And then two, according to Jesus, he didn't perform miracles. Those around him did. Like, can you hit on that? Right. Yeah, yeah, that, that that is actually in the Bible where I forget what what gospel it's in. It might be Luke, 
where he's where he is, you know, someone says he's oh, he's a miracle worker. And he Jesus responds, he said, It wasn't me, it was the person who I healed having faith in me or having faith that that they could be fixed. I didn't really do anything. It was their own faith that cured them. How powerful are belief systems to you, right? Like that that belief that, you know, Jesus or Yeshua or Jeshua or however you want to pronounce his name, like people heard about him coming to their city or their township or their village and immediately had belief that he could heal them. So was it the belief or was it Jesus? Well, to your, it, to your point, right? That is the point. And, and, and if, if you, I mean, again, uh, going back to this book and reading the, the energy codes where the woman's talking about, uh, you know, changing the energy in people who some of, some of whom are, are, you know, have had all kinds of ailments, mental and physical and redirecting their energy. But I, as I read these stories about her talking to people about redirecting the energy, I don't think it's too far different is that if you go to someone uh, like this energy expert that's going to redirect the energy in your body and believe that they can do that for you, well, then you have a much greater chance of that succeeding, uh, of that person helping you. So I think that almost parallels what what, G, what Jesus would, was doing and 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 Jesus was not out there saying, "Hey, look at me! I, I'm great. I'm I'm a, a miracle worker." He kind of was saying, "No, it's not me. It's these people who who believe these things can happen." Sure. And then this one's pretty interesting. Post resurrection, even his closest followers did not recognize Jesus. Is that because he came back in a different form, or is that because uh, his energy was different? Like why? Well, that's. Why is that? That talks about the fact that in the in the Bible the stories are actually a little bit different, and and I'm actually just about to rework a post about the resurrection of Jesus because in one of the Gospels, they they don't recognize him. A, a, a person walks by them, and and there is no recognition that that is Jesus. It's not till kind of after the fact was oh wait a second that was Jesus uh, just there. But you see that in a lot of stories in the Bible, that if you compare some of the Gospels about the birth of Jesus, about the resurrection of Jesus, they don't quite match up. I mean, and I believe even in the Gnostic Gospels, there are stories where uh, basically Jesus dies and that's it. That's the end of the story. Uh, there is no res resurrection as we know it. So different books telling different stories um as you pointed out it's hard for anyone to know exactly what is true and really i i think as far as jesus is concerned the resurrection story is is kind of secondary i mean his his teachings were more about the uh weren't about the miracles and talking about the miracles i mean thomas jefferson had something called the jefferson bible where he got uh, uh, a, a, a good knife and he took his Bible and he cut out the pet, he cut out everything that had to do with miracles and, and he then cut and pasted it into a new book. It was called the Jefferson Bible, became known as that, where he took out all the miracles of Jesus because his belief, and I can't disagree with this, was that Jesus was not about the miracles and you might consider the resurrection as yet another in a series of miracles. It was more about the teachings. Uh, uh, about loving your your fellow man than than it was about the miracles. That was just kind of a sideshow that was tacked on. Wow, how do you come up with these titles, man? You just worked that muscle. I mean, they're, they're pretty they're pretty nice. The, the titles for each story. <laughs> yeah, there's like that. A... That's my advertising background. You have to try to. I try to find a hook. Those you, titles will will frequently you come up bedevil with... me. Oh man, how long do you work on a title? Because I feel like, do you have an app that that produces? No, these no, no, no. That that's my advertising background, writing headlines. So I I try to write things that are catchy, and and frequently I I don't I can write the story and don't have it, and then I have to really drill, you know, go into the story and figure out, okay, what's the most pertinent, interesting hook I can put on this, and and wow. and go from there. Other, other times, honestly, uh, the title leads. And I will, I will write down, I'm going to pull out my little book. I will write down titles that I don't have a story for yet, but I'm like, well, that's an interesting idea. Now I, I 
just need a story around it. I love the book, man. I, I like how you can just open it up and just select a page depending upon like what, you know, I feel like it's going to speak to you wherever you're at. You know what I mean? Like it's kind of like an Oracle almost. Right. Where, you know what I mean? Like you don't necessarily need to read it in sequ sequential order. It's just like open it up and just let it fly. Yeah. You know, I, I, I kind of, you know, I, I write about a lot of different stuff in the book. And I, I thought about it as I'm kind of like this uh, this beach comber. I'm this guy on the beach who has the metal detector. And uh, I, I'm there on the beach. And instead of looking for coins and watches, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for spiritual ideas. And uh, at least now, about once a week, I find one that's worth talking about. And then I hold it up in the air. And it's not a coin or a watch. It's a spiritual idea. And I write a story about it. And, Instead of putting that in my pocket, I, I basically put it out there to the world. I love it. Who who has, I mean, you've read and written about so many different authors and so many different books. Like which book has been the most prolific in your life? Tough call. Um, I uh, really got into Thomas More, who, who uh, his big book many years ago is Care of the Soul. He's written about many dimensions of the soul, the soul in work, the soul in sex, uh, the soul in religion. Um, he taps into this idea of the soul and explains it in a way that that no one else has and, and, and writes so beautifully that uh, I've written about a few of his books. And what I'll do when I read a book, so I'll underline key passages. I'll take the I'll take some of his books back out and I've underlined half the book, which makes it tough to write a single story on. But he has really dug deep into this issue of the soul, which is this deepest part of ourself. I, I, I mean, I, if I think of the soul, I, if, if I look at the body as a house and the spirit is kind of the well-lit attic and our brain is on the main floor, the soul is the dimly lit basement. And that basement just goes deep and goes on forever. And it encompasses our, our history, our, our heritage, our past lives. It, it's really who we are at our core. And he does a beautiful job of explaining it. So he's had a big influence on me. For lighter reading, I don't know why I keep coming back to it, but uh, The Alchemist by mm. Paulo Coelho. I, that, that's my, that's my go-to. Yeah. I, I've read it, you know, four or five times probably over the years. But there's just something about that book and and pursuing your 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 dreams that uh, has always talked to me. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I have it right here actually, right here. Look at that, the alchemist, the alchemist, and like you know, pursuing your dreams and how much courage that takes, right? Like because I feel like you you fall off your path quite a bit. Like the year that he spent in the in the tea shop. And kind of right. forgot about his quest. Yes. And how he's 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 continuing continuously just bombarded with obstacles, you know. Like it is right. an easy path, but yet there's always this pull towards the thing, you know, towards yes. the treasure. And then it's always fascinated me, like when he he starts to um get towards the end and he has to like I don't know if it's metaphoric or what, but like becoming the wind and Right. You know, how do you become the wind? You know, like, is it, is it being, is it like already it's to me, that is the, the, the alchemy point, you know, that is right. turning the, the, it's turning lead into gold or copper into gold or whatever it is. Um, is it, and same thing with manifestation, manif manifestation. It's like, is that turning yourself into wind? Like you becoming the thing that you desire, you know, like the becoming the, the, the finished product, the, you know, quantum jumping, becoming the best version of yourself and already being that. And then you just transform into that, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, well Trey, I mean, you were on that, that path, Trey, right? Because uh, if I'm not mistaken, I mean, you, you have a, a full-time gig and, and you're doing this, this podcast uh, on the side. I mean, I, I kind of did the same thing for years as well. I, I mean, working the full-time gig but realizing that there was more to life than that. 
And uh, I think some of that is maybe why the, the we can relate to the the alchemist. It was not forgetting that dream, even if other things get in the way, the other obstacles. We all have these obstacles in life, and, and you have to push past them to what's really important. Um, yeah, don't get lost, right? Or you, no, actually, don't forget or re-remember, right? Like I feel like those are the reoccurring themes. Like he just keeps remembering his, you know, his right. Past. Even he gets even in the desert when he like finds his love of his life. Like still, he's pulled towards his quest. Like what, right. What what's your quest, Tom? Like what what has been pulling you for, for all these years? Is is it the blogs? Is it the book? Like what is it? Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I'm 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 thinking about um, there's uh, this analogy that that the writer David Brooks uses, and he he wrote this book called The Second Mountain. And there's in life a first mountain and a second mountain, and that first mountain is you being propelled by your career. You're propelled by wanting to make more money to get more stuff to get a bigger home, a nicer car. And that becomes the first mountain in life. But at a certain point, ideally, we don't, all don't reach the stage. We begin to kind of come down that first mountain. We realize that that's maybe not the stuff that really matters. And we then head for this second mountain. And while the first mountain is in service of the ego, the second mountain is more in service of the soul where you you hit this point in life where you begin to say, hey, I, not only do I know there's more out there, I'm going to pursue it. And uh, I mean, I am definitely on that that second mountain now. And, and my intent is to uh, really do a, a deeper dive. I mean, just one more analogy. Uh, Arthur Brooks, he, he talks about this Indian system where that spits that splits life into life up into four phases. And in that first phase of life, you're learning, you're in school, high school, college. The second phase, you're really concerned with your career. You're 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 after, you know, uh uh money, fame, sex, success. You then segue away to this third phase where that becomes a little less important. It's what uh, Brooks refers to as the second stage, but for Arthur Brooks, there's a fourth stage. And that fourth stage is you kind of like release your attachment to this, you know, this stuff that was once important to you. You begin to almost shed some of the responsibilities and even possessions that you have. And you begin making, taking this deeper dive into whatever spirit it can be any subject for me it's spirituality whatever really interests you and you de you dive deeper into that and then you kind of tell or teach others uh about what you've learned and what you know and and i feel like i'm i'm hitting that that fourth stage right now where i've kind of scratched the surface and and i think that's what the book does i mean i i as you mentioned i cover a lot of ideas a lot of different writers but now it's time to take some of these ideas and, and, and start doing deeper dives into them. Mm. So that that's definitely next. That's what's talking to me next. Wow. Yeah. And, and like, I'm assuming it's similar to like myself where it never gets old, right? Like it's always, it's like, I could have these conversations all the time. Like, I mean, it just, it, it never seems like work to me. It's just, it, 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 ignites that fire inside because it's like you're on to something positively you know, you know it, it's funny because we had a brief conversation i'm going to hold this up you're, uh, yogananda's book now, if you remember that book uh wisdom you mentioned this to me wisdom of a yogi because i think you actually spoke to the the author before mm -hmm. so uh i have on my nightstand books i purchased because i write the column i have books sent to me all the time uh this was on my nightstand and i just picked it up today and, and I, I read the first uh, you know, just the introduction of the book. And I thought, oh, my God, I got to read this book right away because I I, I, yeah. I start looking. Yes, I start looking at it and I'm like, well, this is interesting. And and it's and I, I know you you find this on the podcast. I find it in these books and I write about them. I'm like, wow, I, these ideas I've read about before, but he's kind of got a new take. And this seems really interesting. And I can't wait to read it.
Sure. Like the, the whole idea around Yogananda and the, the, the tiger Swami, right? He talks about the tiger Swami in Yogananda's book. Like, I just thought it was a guy wrestling tigers, right? And, and Riz, the author of um, Wisdom of a Yogi, says and totally changes my perspective saying the tiger we face tigers every day and we wrestle with them it's our thoughts you know it's the right. negativity you know it's the it's the noise out in the world we're just fighting tigers all the time and back back circling back to the point of like going within like you know yogananda always wanted to run away like always 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 wanted to run away to the himalayas and you know he makes it a point in that book to say you don't need to go into a cave just create a space, a set, you know, a, a sacred space for yourself in your house to where there is right. absolutely no distractions and go within. Right. And then people get, I think there's, there's, a, there's something to this. I think people get kind of um, freaked out about going into meditation because they don't know what to expect or they don't know how to meditate. Right. Um, they get in, they sit down and they're just so used to the noise of the outside world that their attention spans are so much shorter now and they, they get into meditation. Am I doing it right? And then, and then the tigers pop up and they're all over the place and they, they take you down. And, you know, in psychology, there is studies that, that support the idea that people just don't know how to meditate. And, um, it's, it's about repetition. It's about getting in there and just kind of, you know, just sitting with yourself. Like, do we really truly even know ourselves? Like the, the awareness behind the eyes, the, the, the presence that is sitting here, and not having, uh, you know, a, a cell phone in my hand or reading a book, but actually just being in silence. I, what I like to do is get up really early in the morning and before anybody's up and go down on the couch and do some breathing, breathing techniques and then put like, um, like a little something over my eyes. So it blacks everything out and just sit in the awareness, you know, like right. sometimes I can have some profound insights you know, that are similar to the, the quantum jumping insights, but it's like meaningful for me. And those like, you're not going to, I don't think you have like this massive res revelation every time, but it's like, there's something there that is always valuable that can help you in your everyday life. Get you, you know, it could be something inspiring that's going to help you throughout the day. It's like, it could be something right. small, like just little small stuff that, that kind of gets you through it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that, that process. And I, I have a very similar one. Uh, it first went up in the morning, uh, these days, uh, out in the sofa, uh, flick on the, uh, the electric fireplace, uh, have a cup of coffee, but th that's it. You, you, you need that, that, that place of, of stillness. Uh, I heard it referred to uh, as quietude to kind of get things going, get things started. Um, you know, you mentioned meditation and, and I, I, I think, um, one of the things that helped me was, you know, meditation, you have to stick it out. You have to be forgiving of yourself. And what I do to this day is I will frequently, I'll, I'll just go to a, a, an app. Headspace is a pretty good one. I actually like uh, Sam Harris has an app called waking up and he does these guided meditations and uh, you know, S Sam will take you through the meditation and, uh, he he can go quiet for, you know, long passages, 30 seconds might go by. You haven't heard anything and it might get easier for your mind to wander. And he's, and he will know that. And he'll say, is your mind wandering? Bring it back to the breath, bring it back to the breath. So if anyone's listening and think they don't get meditation, one, a great place to start is just with some guidance through, through an app. And there's sure. plenty out there. And it's funny, like you bring that up, like how uncomfortable do we get when there's silence too? Right. Like just in interviews, like if there's any type of silence or space that no one's speaking, like there's an awkwardness to that. I feel like right. we're just not comfortable with the silence, you know, like that inner silence. Like, what do we do? Like, I don't know what to do with my hands right now. Like I'm thinking about tomorrow that, that uncomfortableness like pops up in different thoughts, but like, right. I don't know. It's, it takes like, to your point, it takes work and it's, it's something that expands your consciousness. And I think you were talking about this. Like, didn't, wasn't there a book of like GIs that started meditating and they totally changed? That that was probably the, the first spirituality book I ever read. Yeah, it was a uh, uh, it was about the um, warrior spirit, warrior spirit, and it was about a guy who went in to teach 
kind of sensitivity training to a bunch of green berets. And this is back in the seventies. And he was into meditation type techniques, breathing and such. And, and these guys fought it for a long time. These guys were, were, you know, were can do hard asses, but eventually he gets them to stick with it. And then they start, you know, progressing. And, and and they actually start feeling better about themselves. They actually start performing better in, in, in the tasks they do. And he goes on to say, he, he, I picked up, a, I had read the book 40 years ago. I picked a, a copy of it about six months ago. And in and, and a new edition, he went back and talked to guys who were in the program 30 years previously. And, and these guys say, hey, man, that kind of changed my life. That set me on like a different path. F. And if I hadn't gone through that training, I wouldn't be the person I am today. What do you think it is about meditation that softens the heart, right? I don't know. I mean, it's, you know, you can see studies where it's absolutely proven to work. Uh, I mean, to chill people out. But um, I think it returns the body to a more natural state. And we talk about you have mentioned all the uh distractions we have in modern life and it wasn't always like this we didn't have uh you know the social media 24-hour news um constant forms of entertainment around us that is a recent development so i think it brings us back to a more natural state where mm -hmm. we should probably spend more time sure Absolutely. Um, and, and going back to Yogananda's story, like I, I didn't, until I read Riz's book and, um, some other literature on Yogananda, I didn't realize how much he like was actually like proactive and like spirituality, like all the seminars that he gave, all the travel that he did, all the speaking engagements, all the books, all the literature, all the poems, like, I mean, just all the stuff that he was had to do all the, the Institute that he had to run, like, guy was traveling you know what i mean like and he wasn't traveling in in an airplane he was like he came over here on a boat in like boston in the winter he, he comes from india right and the temperatures are totally different comes over to boston like winter time i can only imagine what that was like and then he's traveling across the country on rail on the rail system and like he's doing all of these things but still maintaining his spirituality right so, to me that's inspirational like if Yogananda could do all these things, like I too can find time in my day to sit in my what whatever my recliner or or chair or something and and connect right like and and have and maintain that connection with the universe that he talks about. Yeah, I, I mean, if I'm if I'm not mistaken either, I mean, he was did not intend to stay in the U.S. for long, but was here for for decades. Because th that's where he uh, he saw the need, where the need was. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it, it. I mean, you and I are not Yogananda, but but I I feel like you are drawn to these things, uh, and, and it's why you do a podcast. It's right. I why I write the blog posts because you realize that there's some important stuff going on out there and yeah you can keep it all to yourself but you kind of want to spread the word you want to let other people know about it well it's like plato's cave right like when they escape the cave and they find their truth like it's so totally different than what their old truth was like the shadows on the cave wall that was an illusion like they know that that isn't truth so they immediately want to go and, and relieve the the prisoners that are inside that cave the problem is is that the prisoners in the cave think the guy who escaped is, is crazy out of his mind. So they'll do anything to stay in the cave because that's a reality and that's their comfort zone, even if they have to kill the guy who's trying to free them, right? Um, right. Was, like that's, I think Yogananda was a part of that, that. He was a freedom fighter, if I'm you know bold enough to say that, because he's trying to show people right. a different reality. And he was, you know, he's talking about this place may, possibly being assimilation too, talking about how, you know, he used to go see picture movies in the theaters when the Great World War was happening and how he had this vision of um, God telling him because he was struggling with uh, all the people, all the lives lost in the war. And he's, you know, like 
and this voice came to him and, and basically showed him like a movie screen, like, you know, a projector film on the, on the screen. He's like, what is good and what is good and what is bad? You know, this reality really is the light. You are a part of the light. If it wasn't, if it was all sunshines and rainbows, no one would evolve and, and pain is a prod. Uh, it's a prod to get man to come back home, right. To come right. back home to himself. So, well, that, I mean, it, yes, that's the old idea. I mean, everything in life, I mean, um, there, there are just lessons to be learned uh, everywhere, and 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 if life was a you know uh, you know a total bowl of cherries, then you wouldn't learn these lef lessons, and and you wouldn't grow as a person. These obstacles are really a part of life, and you know might be designed for our, our, our own growth. Sure, Tom, man, I could talk to you for months, <laughs> dude. This we'll have to do awesome. it again. Yes, absolutely, for sure. Uh, how can people find your stuff? How can they find your blog? How can they buy your book? Well, uh, the book is, is wake up call daily insights for the spirit, spiritually curious. Uh, you can find it at uh, everywhere, but, uh, Amazon uh, easy to find at Amazon. Uh, you can find my blog, wake up call at Pathios. Uh, so just look up wake up call, uh, plus Pathios and you'll find my blog. I put out stories about once a week. And feel free to check it out. I mean, it'll, it'll give you a good idea of the kind of stories that are in the book. Sure. I might have to hit you up for a title on this one. Um, All right. Tom, we're definitely going to do this again, dude. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you uh, for representing uh, the Eastern Shore. Some good people down there doing some good work. So thank you, buddy. Hey, I love it. I was, I was at the, uh, the, the Snow Hill Oyster Fest oh, this, this wow. past Saturday. Yeah. Oh, wow. Pretty cool. Thank you.